All right. Good afternoon to everyone. Again, I think it's better that we uh, we start this uh, event uh, in order not to not to lose any precious time from our from our afternoon and from our morning in the case of our Finnish participants. So, dear participants, warm welcome to all of you in this Finland Malaysia Education Leadership Forum. I'm very happy to see so many of you online together with us. And I think we are still still getting some latecomers right now. My name is Eero Väisenen. I'm from the Embassy of Finland here in Kuala Lumpur. And we'll be guiding you through today's program, which you should see on the screen presently. Uh, at this point, I would also like to inform everyone that this uh, event uh, will be recorded. So the event is scheduled to last for one and a half hours. Uh, and after the first welcoming remarks, we will have two esteemed keynote speakers, both from Malaysia and from Finland, followed by a panel discussion with four Finnish universities who will be introducing their own solutions and the Finnish context further, as well as discussing the future of educational leadership. At the end of the program, we have reserved some time for questions and answers. So please, if you have any questions to the keynote speakers or the panelists at any point during the event or any issues you would like to raise, uh, please use the chat function of the, of the Zoom application to present your questions and they will be addressed uh, towards the end of the program. But for now, once again, uh, most warm, warmly welcome to all of you and let us begin by giving the floor to His Ex Excellency, Mr. Sami Leino, Ambassador of Finland to Malaysia, who will be setting us on the way with some welcoming words. Please, Ambassador, the word is to you. Thank you, Eero. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants, it's a great pleasure for me to deliver this opening remarks today on behalf behalf of the Embassy of Finland for this Finnish Malaysia, the Finland Malaysia Education Leadership Forum we are having today. And as we all know, COVID-19 situation globally has created an unprecedented disruption, especially in the lives of children out of schools. Pupils, schools, teachers and families have been putting in enormous efforts to cope with distance learning best they can. Being a father of two teenagers myself, I have witnessed, witnessed this almost every day in my, at my own home. Overall, the situation during this pandemic has reminded us of the many roles and responsibilities of education. Schools and kindergartens are not only there for test results and academic learning, but also as safeguards of well-being and safe places for children. We have been longing for the old normal, the interaction with others, the brick and mortar school buildings and learning environments. But even with this disruption, we must continue to develop and transform. There are many lessons available from these exceptional times. Even if we would like to go back to normal, we believe the experiences from these times and disruption will have many lasting impacts in development of education systems as a whole, in pedagogical methods and in approaches in learning environments and materials. During our 100 years of independence, Finland has changed from being a rather poor agrarian nation into a prosperous, safe and stable country. And I, I would like to emphasize that education has been one of the most important reasons that has made this success story possible. High quality teacher training, training significant autonomy of schools and taking into account individual needs of all children are, are some of the defining elements of the Finnish education system, which, as many of you know, is considered to be among one of the best in the world. In Malaysia, the government has likewise ambitious plans for the development of the education system and for improving the quality of education on all levels, 
<clears throat> including strengthening of the professionalism of teachers and ensuring that the curriculum, curriculum remains relevant to the needs of today's world. In addition to public schools, a wide variety of private institutions provide high quality education from early childhood to university here in Malaysia. And of course, in addition to, yeah, however, no matter how, how progressive education policies and government programs are, we believe that to achieve a real change in attitudes and in culture, culture of schools, we need the commitment of all teachers and especially the commitment of the principals. In Finland, we think that school principals are the leaders of change and managers who define the first steps for doing something new, something different. School principals have a high profile role in transforming our schools in valuable and well-performing institutions, and their commitment is necessary for obtaining successful results. In fact, we see that for managing change, you need not only persistence and patience, but also most of all, the commitment to learn together. In challenging times, such as during the pandemic, the role of not only the excellent teachers, but also our principals has been crucial. Moving forward, strong, strong leadership and vision in the field of education is required to help our youth to meet the rapidly changing needs of the society around us. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, I'm really pleased to open this webinar on the development of educational leadership. In education in general, but especially during these times, we need international cooperation to reinvent and redevelop strategies and approaches in education to share experiences and lessons we have learned. And I, I sincerely believe that opportunities like the forum we are having today to share expertise, best practices and ideas are very much needed. Finland is always happy to share our experiences and work together with international partners to develop education even further. The four Finnish universities that are joining us today provide an excellent example of expertise and insight on the topic of education leadership. We also very much look forward also to learning from the experience of others from successes, but of course also from failures. And we are really happy and lucky to have some leading Malaysian experts joining our event today as speakers and also in the audience. We must work together to emerge stronger from these extraordinary times, ready for to face the challenges of the future. So with these opening remarks, I hope you have all a very successful and interesting event today. And I very much look forward to hearing about the emerging cooperation between partners in Malaysia and Finland. We here at the Embassy of Finland are always at your service. We are working to strengthen the ties and contacts between Finland and Malaysia. Thank you very much and back to you, Eero. Thank you so much, Ambassador Leino, for those introductory remarks. Now it is time to welcome our first keynote speaker, uh, Ms. Nina Adlan Disney, Executive Director of LIPED Services, who will be addressing the topic of educational leadership in Malaysia. Ms. Nina has 30 years of experience in the Malaysian education sector as an academic, administrator, publisher, researcher, consultant, uh, and mother of three, not the least. Both lawyer and educator by profession, she has held a variety of leadership roles spanning the entire spectrum of learning and development, including being a CEO of Asia Pacific Schools, as well as Malaysia Airlines Academy. She was the co-founder of Education Quarterly and Prospect magazines, and has been engaged as an independent policy and strategy consultant for a range of local and regional edu education projects. In 2017, she joined LIPED, a homegrown education service provider and an award-winning social enterprise, known, for example, for their Trust School program, covering a network of 94 schools, 6,000 teachers, and more than 100,000 students nationwide. So please, Ms. Nina, the floor is yours. 
Thank you, Eero, for that very kind introduction and good morning uh, to those in Europe and good afternoon uh, to those in Asia. Um, as we know, our focus here today is on educational leadership, and I'm very, very honored and privileged to have been invited to provide some insights uh, based on our experience in um, the organization that I represent, which Eero uh, has mentioned, LEPED Services. So maybe if you could just just allow me a couple of minutes to set the context of what we do at LEPED, because some of you may not be familiar, because uh, the comments that I'll be making about uh, school leadership in Malaysia is very much based on uh, what we have seen at the coalface, um, so to speak. Uh, so as Aero has mentioned, we are a social enterprise. Uh, we were initially established by Malaysia's sovereign wealth fund, Kazana. Uh, who saw this project very much as part of the nation building uh, initiative. Um, however, just to bring you an update, as of last year, LEPED has actually gone independent after a management buyout uh, exercise by myself and, and three other partners. But we are very much keeping LEPED uh, true to its original mission uh, as a social enterprise. So what exactly do we do as a social enterprise in the education transformation space? Well, we are probably best known for the program that Aero has also mentioned, the Trust School program. This Trust School program is um, offered under a public-private partnership, a PPP, uh, which is pioneering and quite unique uh, quite unique globally, in fact, not just unique in Malaysia. Uh, it is a PPP which sees public schools in intervention that takes place in public schools over a period of three to five years, after which those schools are handed back, so to speak, to the Ministry of Education. Um, so they remain obviously as MOE Ministry of Education schools throughout the program. Uh, so our intervention is there um, as a temporary measure, if you like. So within that three to five years, it is crucial that you know, we make the change that we want to see and that that change is sustainable and scalable. Um, so just to uh, highlight that there are three partners in this uh, public-private partnership. One is, of course, the Malaysian Ministry of Education. Uh, there is also Yasan Amir, which is the foundation that uh, oversees the whole program. And LIPED, our role, is as uh, the service provider for this program. And as service provider, what that means is that we have been tasked to design, develop, and deliver the program. So we're not just consultants that come up with a great framework and then walk away. We actually see the program through uh, to its conclusion. Okay, so that's just by way of uh, introduction for those of you who are not familiar with LEPED. Um, I would also like to start off by saying that the tr this trust school program was very much conceived as a demonstration model. So the rationale behind it was as an attempt to trial solutions and discover what can be achieved if we focus on the right developmental priorities. So obviously, as part of that exercise, we did a very extensive and comprehensive scan of various educational reform initiatives around the world, including, of course, Finland. Uh, but of course, what we learned very early on is that no matter how successful uh, interventions or solutions might be in one system, you cannot just transplant them you know, wholesale and expect them to take root. Uh, there is always an element of customization to ensure that solutions that have worked in another context are adapted to meet the local context. So it's not just a question of um, adopting international best practices, it's about adopting relevant international best practices because not everything uh, will be relevant uh, to Malaysia. Um, and as such, um, the Trust School program and all our other interventions are very much aligned to the aspirations of Malaysia's education blueprint, uh, and of course, to the um, aspirations of uh, the SDG 4. 
Um, and also, uh, by way of introduction, I should say that this trust school program does not change, well, it changes the culture of the school, but we don't change the infrastructure, we don't change the teachers, we don't change the curriculum, we don't change the leaders. We take all the schools as is. We take a school as we find the school and we support and coach the school to become improved and better versions of themselves. So it really isn't about coming in with a one size fits all solution. We are very much, um, tied to the concept of baselining and uh, having data-driven approaches and uh, employing and applying uh, interventions that are required for that specific school context and that specific school community. Uh, and then finally, I think in terms of, by way of introduction, I should say that in terms of funding, uh, the program, the trust school program that we implement is funded entirely by corporate uh, sponsorships. Um, so while obviously the Ministry of Education has an allocated budget to schools, we work within that school budget and any additional cost of the trust school program comes via uh, sponsorship. So it's a, excuse me, it's a very interesting model and it is a model that I have to say uh, has shown some success uh, 10 years on uh, trust the trust school program has been successfully implemented in 94 schools around uh, Malaysia uh, and as Eero mentioned reaching over 6,000 teachers and over 160,000 uh, students nationwide and also another important point is this this model can be applied to any school setting we were very, um, you know, it was very important to us that it wasn't just confined to a specific type of school. Those of you who know Malaysia will know that we have a very diverse uh, school system. We have very diverse demographics. So the trust school program has been applied in many types of schools. The 94 schools, some of them are in rural areas, some of them are in urban areas, uh, some of them are in indigenous uh, communities, Orang Asli, we are also uh, in Chinese vernacular schools, Chinese schools, Tamil schools, Islamic schools, boarding schools, you name it. Uh, we have uh, tried this model in a variety of school settings. And I think that the data from our impact studies kind of speak for themselves in terms of the success that we have achieved. So I would say that today, if you were to step inside a trust school, and unfortunately it is difficult to step inside a trust school because we've had a very prolonged period of uh, school closures uh, in Malaysia, but if you were to step inside a trust school, I think, would like to think that you will feel an immediate palpable difference in terms of the school environment. Uh, I think you would find students who are happy, who are vocal, who are highly engaged in their learning. I think you would find teachers and school leaders and an entire school community who are committed to unlocking the potential of each and every child. So then the question would be, how, what was our approach? What did we do? And it seems blindingly obvious, but I think, it starts by putting students at the center of everything we do. Uh, unfortunately, in many education systems, Malaysia included, we lose sight of that very central proposition that we are here to support the student and holistic student outcomes, right? And in order to maximize those student outcomes, the key step is to galvanize the entire ecosystem towards achieving those aims, right? And when we talk about holistic student outcomes, we are, of course, talking about um, features like confidence, critical thinking, communication, collaborative learning. I think Malaysia, in common with many Asian countries, we are very good at achieving academic results 
but unfortunately we are not so good at achieving these more holistic uh, features which are very much required moving into uh, the future. So what we have done within the Trust School program is to deploy coaches, deploy advisors uh, from many different countries. It's been an international effort. We've had, including Finland, we've had a Finnish uh, advisor who was uh, based up in, uh, well, he was involved in Perlis, he was involved in schools in, in Sabah. So it's very much an international approach, uh, but as I said, very much uh, contextualized for each individual school. Uh, and in that exercise, we obviously work very closely with teachers, school leaders, parents, the community, the state education officials in Malaysia, that's called JPN. Uh, but then within the state, there are also district education uh, officials called the PPD. So what we have done over the 10 years is to work with all of these parties, bring them together, and we have um, worked together to co-construct improvement targets based on the takeoff value, based on the TOV of each individual school. Okay, so here is where we come to um, school leaders. Right. Uh, the role of school leaders is obviously critical. Our vision for Malaysian schools sees school leaders as leaders of learning. And that seems like a very simple proposition, but to get that right and to actually get that, you know, to translate the rhetoric into reality is not always easy. And it is usually due to mindset issues, right? There are many uh, principals within Malaysian schools who've been through a conveyor belt kind of uh, career where the focus, the, 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 the climax is to become a principal, but as a principal, they then lose touch with what is happening in their schools. They become uh, very much administrators as opposed to instructional leaders. So that's what we attempt to do in the trust schools. We attempt to coach the school leadership team, and here emphasis is on the team, on how they can best empower and develop their teachers, their students, and their community in general, their school community in general. And I think one key lesson that we have learned is that educational leadership cannot rely exclusively on one individual as important as that one individual is, no matter how effective and charismatic that individual might be, the focus must be on a leadership team that can continuously drive improvement and change. Uh, because another systemic issue facing uh, Malaysian schools is that there is a high degree of turnover among school leaders. So if you put too much emphasis on one individual, if that individual goes, then you're not going to have the culture that will sustain uh, the change. So because of that, one feature that we very much emphasize in uh, our trust schools are middle leaders. Yes, middle leaders play a key role in trust schools, and they're not necessarily just the existing panel or department heads, but we actually conduct a social network analysis uh, exercise in order to identify change agents, uh, change agents who will act as critical catalysts in sustaining a positive school culture. Okay, so uh, I think in my closing remarks, I would just like to maybe highlight five issues uh, facing school leaders in, in Malaysia, which can possibly we can expand upon uh, during the panel discussion. But based on our experience in the trust school program, five key issues. One, students and system. Two, cash versus culture. Three, capacity and caliber. Four, autonomy and authenticity. And five, 
data and development. So let me just briefly say a few words about each of those five areas before I close and, and hand back to Aero. So with students and system, very simply, although we have highlighted the fact that students must be at the center, our experience shows that you cannot sustain that change if you don't bring the system with you. In fact, it can be argued that in Malaysia, there've been too many student initiatives. You know, whether it's English, digital initiatives, STEM initiatives, they, they keep coming and going. But I think the issue here is that when they're planting these initiatives, they're not actually checking the soil conditions. Uh, so the analogy would be that the soil conditions are the system. So if you don't have a system that is going to be receptive to all these wonderful um, student initiatives, it's not going to work. Uh, two, cash versus culture. In Malaysia, we actually have a very healthy education budget. Tomorrow, they'll be announcing the budget again, and I'm sure that once again, education will get the lion's share of the budget. In 2021, this was 50 billion ringgit. But the key point to note here that in Malaysia's education budget, 80% of that budget is spent on emoluments. So that shows us straight away where our focus has to be. Our focus has to be on developing the capacity of those within the system, because that's where our money is going. And it could be argued that Malaysia doesn't get a very good return on that investment. And even if you look at our spending as a percentage of our GDP, it is on a par with upper middle income and even some high income nations. So really it's a question of how do we optimize what we are already spending um, instead of throwing more money at the problem, okay? Uh, the third uh, issue was capacity and culture, uh, sorry, capacity and caliber. So here, uh, as we said, it's related to our spending. If 80% of our education budget is spent on emoluments, then we owe it to our students to ensure that we build the capacity of those in the system and that we have uh, teachers and leaders of the right caliber. And I'm sure we're all familiar with the aphorism. I think uh, McKinsey came up with it in a report in 2007, where they said that uh, the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And I think that is something that Finland, right, has taken to heart in terms of recruiting the brightest and the best. And while that is clearly true, I think we can maybe modify that aphorism by saying that the quality of an education system cannot exceed the quality of its teaching. Uh, and hence the focus has to be on, yes, we have teachers, but we owe it to those teachers to develop and upskill their professional uh, development so that their teaching can be the best that it can be uh, for our students autonomy and authenticity. So once you build capacity, this, you can give autonomy. I think autonomy is not something that can just be given. Uh, that would be irresponsible. Autonomy comes with responsibility and can only be given once we have people in the system with the capacity to exercise that autonomy uh, responsibly and with accountability. Uh, and that is related to authenticity. At the moment, unfortunately in Malaysia, many of our um, instruments that we use to measure, for example, school quality or performance appraisals are not done authentically. It is done very much as a tick box exercise. And what we have tried to do with the Trust School Program is to provide a safe space so that you're not having very high stakes uh, attached to a performance appraisal so that we can be more genuine in accepting our weaknesses and working and developing uh, our competencies. Uh, and then last but not least, data and development. Once we have more authentic assessment, then we can be more data-driven uh, in our practices and um, you know, achieve uh, and make decisions based on data, not just on gut instinct. So that's really all that I uh, wanted to say. I hope that I've given 
something of an overview of the very real issues faced by the Malaysian education system, uh, even more so in, in the context of the pandemic. Uh, I would like to say that, you know, in an ideal world, some of the outcomes that we've achieved in the trust school program will be replicated across the 10,000 schools uh, in Malaysia. It is very much a cultural transformation. It is very much a transformation which requires a change in mindset, which requires teachers and school leaders to be open uh, to trying new things. And when we have that culture that is accepting uh, to change, then we will be in a much better position to deal with any unforeseen crises in the future. Um, when we have students who are independent learners, who can drive their own learning, when we have teachers who are confident in trying out new things, in uh, adopting and adapting to technology, then we will have the education system that we all deserve. Uh, we're not quite there yet, but transformation is very much a journey. And I know that Finland has been on this journey, started on this journey before us. So there are many, many lessons uh, to be learned. So I hope that we can continue to learn from one another. And in this era of global challenges, we very much need to find global solutions. So that's it from me. Thank you very much. I'll hand over back to Eero. Thank you so much, Miss Nina, for that uh, interesting overview rooted in experience. Uh, as our second keynote speaker, we have Dr. Kari Kumpulainen, the director of the Oul University Teacher Training School, who will be delivering an address on the subject of leadership in an educational context. Dr. Kumpulainen has published more than 40 scientific articles, mostly on the area of educational leadership. Uh, uh, sorry, mostly on the area of educational technology. And during his 30 year career, Dr. Dr. Kumpulainen has visited more than 50 countries as an educational expert, and his primary interests are teacher training and leadership and management. More than 10 years, Dr. Kumpulainen was also leading the educational technology thematic interest group of the European Teacher Education Network, including more than 60 universities around the world. So without any further ado, please, Dr. Kumpulainen, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eero. And good afternoon, Malaysia. Good morning, Finland. Just like you told, I'm Dr. Kari Kumpulainen and I'm the head of Oulu University Teacher Training School. First of all, I want to thank the Embassy of Finland, Kuala Lumpur, especially honored Ambassador Sami Leino, First Secretary Eero Väisenen and Miss Anna Korpi for inviting me uh, to this Education Leadership Forum. I hope that this forum will provide you knowledge you need to make your future plan when uh, developing education systems and schools. I also want to thank Nina Adlan Disney for your presentation. It was interesting and it's easy to agree with your message. The title of my 50 minute keynote presentation is Leadership in Pedagogical Context. Because the time is very limited, I will concentrate on the very first word of, uh, in my title, so I'm talking about leadership. Uh, uh, Eero Weisen already introduced me, so I can just conclude that I, I'm a young man with more than 100 year experience and more than 30 years I have been working as a teacher trainer and I have been enjoying every single moment. So it's good to continue on that business. Uh, I believe that many of you, you are principals, you might be head teachers, school managers. If so, you are leaders or you might be aiming to be a leader. The first thing to recognize uh, of this job is the fact that leadership, it's difficult. In my mind, it's the most difficult job in the world. 
We have about 8 billion people living on planet Earth, and each of them, they are one kind, one kind of. They have their own values, requirements, opinions. And that is the reason why leaders are needed. Leaders are needed to recognize the potential and talent of the people, and together with them make the organization to work effectively. A lot of research is done about the leadership, and thousands of books are written. Next, I will pick up some basic questions that rise from the literature. The first question is, uh, why are we talking about this topic? Why leadership matters? Why is it important? Simply saying, leaders are powerful. Everything in human society, it rises and it falls on leadership. The world becomes a better place when people become better leaders. Schools will be better if principals and school leaders get proper, tra proper training to do the demanding jobs. As a school leader, you know that your staff, your teachers, they matter, and they matter a lot. If children are lucky and they get a good teacher, that will be guarantee that, that they have a, a good life ahead. But if a child was not so lucky, if you got a bad teacher, then you are in serious trouble. One incompetent teacher, he or she, can ruin thousands of thousands of lives during his or her academic career. Likewise, as an incompetent leader, you can easily ruin your school culture. But if you are a good leader, your school it will be flourishing. You have the power. But just like we heard in previous presentation, you are not alone. You have teachers, you have your teams, you have your stuff around. Select your team carefully, because in my mind, recruiting is number one job for a leader in every organization. Well, where are the leaders coming from? And sometimes people are asking that, can I be a leader? Well, you have to know that leaders are not born unless, unless you are royal. Some people, they are born with more natural gifts that will, be, uh, that will help them lead at higher level. Everyone still has potential to become a leader. Leadership, it can be developed and it can be improved by anyone who is willing to put in effort. Sometimes people are claiming and asking, title and seniority, it will automatically make me a leader. Is it true or not? Well, I have to say that this is old culture, but it still exists. We all leaders, we easily refer to the seniority of ours if that exists. Did you remark that in the beginning of my presentation, I told you that I have more than 30 years experience. And by saying so, I was trying to convince you that I have some seniority and I was getting uh, some respect. But leadership, it's like maturity. It doesn't come automatically uh, with AIDS. Sometimes AIDS, it comes alone. Lesson in this uh, that uh, you can have no title and seniority and you can be a good leader. Becoming a leader, it requires desire and some basic tools. Sometimes I have heard that the people are saying, well, I'm waiting until I get the position and then I start to develop me as a leader. Don't wait. Why to wait? Your opportunity, it's a proud thing. Legendary um, basketball coach from California, John Wooden, he said uh, sometimes that when opportunity comes, it's too late to prepare. You have to prepare in time. If you start learning about leadership now, 
not only will you increase your own opportunities, but you will also make the most of them when they arrive. You have to prepare, you have to do your studies in time. Just choose a good training and start today. Don't, and you don't regret, I will guarantee. John Maxwell is one of my favorite authors in leadership. Uh, he wrote a book which name is Developing the Leadership uh, Within You 2.0. In this book, he describes five levels of leadership. And I want to share that idea with you. But before introducing those levels, I have a task for you. Please try to position yourself. On which level of leadership are you at the moment? And what about your colleagues or principals in your schools? What level of leadership do they present? You do not need to tell that to me or to the others, but perhaps you can discuss about that title later. So, Level number one, it's called position. And that is the most basic entry level uh, leadership. On that level, people, they follow you because they have to do. That uh, position level uh, leadership, it represents leadership before leader has developed any real influence with the people being led. Positional leaders, uh, they have certain rights, of course. They have a right to enforce the rules. They have a right to tell people to do their jobs. Principal in a school, he or she can say that you need to do this job because I say so. But a real leadership, it's more than having granted authority. If you are a pedagogical leader and your teachers and other staff, other staff members, they feel fear for you, then you have to do something. Real leadership, it's being a person who others will gladly and confidently follow. Real leaders, they know the difference between position and influence. No matter if you are a leader in a school or business, position, it's a good place to start in leadership, but it's a terrible place to stay. Uh, that level leaders, they are often saying I, while real leaders, they say we. Position level leaders, they often say go, while real leaders, they say let's go, let's do it together. Level two, it's called permission. And on that level, people follow the leader because they want to do that. They want to follow. And permission is characterized by good relationships. Teachers in your school, they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. Permission level uh, leaders, they understand that true influence begins with heart, not head. Permission, it flourishes through personal connections, not rules, not regulations. As you connect with people, build relationships with them and earn their trust so you can begin to develop real influence with them. Level number three, it's called production. People follow a leader because of what you have done for the organization. If you manage to obtain resource, resources for your school, let's say money, good books, computers, nice furniture, or what, whatever, teachers are thinking that you are effective and you are productive. That means that you have earned your stripes as a leader. To really get things going, you need to win the production level. Production level leaders and staff together, they produce uh, results. Principals, principal is working together with 
uh, teachers, he or she knows that he can't cope alone. Uh, when level three leadership prevails, could things really begin to happen for the organization or school? In school, that means that children and students, they will learn more and the quality of learning is better than earlier. Uh, schools and uh, organizations in general with leaders who are effective in leading on the uh, first three levels of leadership, they become highly successful. If you position yourself on level three and uh, you and your staff, they are doing a good job, I can tell you that. Level number four, it called, it, it's called a people development. So on that level, people follow you because of what you have done for them. Leaders become great, not because of their power, but because of the ability to empower others. To create anything lasting, to develop a school community that can grow and improve, to build school for the future, leaders' main responsibility is to develop other people to help them reach their professional potential, to help them do teachers' job more effectively, and to help them learn to become leaders themselves. If teachers have a level four leader in school, they tend to be loyal on that level teach, uh, sorry, leader. Level four leaders understand the value of professional development. Teachers in his or her school, they have access to further education and they are happy and willing to participate. Sadly to say, but according to my experience, most leaders are not aware that level four leading even exists. They are so focused, they are so keen on their own productivity. Pin Eagle uh, level five, that is the highest level of leadership and it's based on reputation and respect. People follow their leader because of who you are and what you represent. Uh, I can tell you that only a few people have reached this level. Those who do, they have led well and proven their leadership over a lifetime. They have invested in other leaders and raised them up to level four. Level five leaders have developed influence, not only in their own organizations, but beyond them. Level five uh, people are known outside their own organizations, outside of their fields, their countries, and even lifetimes. Just to name a few, I mentioned Aristotle, Leonardo da Vinci, Martin Luther King, uh, Nelson Mandela. To sum up, uh, good leadership in schools and likewise in business, it's based on goodwill, it's based on active and systematic work, and most importantly, good leadership, it's based on trust. Trust is also the key word in Finnish education system. Dear pedagogical leaders, trust on your staff, trust on your teachers, trust on your partners, and trust on yourself. If you trust on yourself, then you trust also on future, and your future, it will be bright. They are all coming from Finland, I want to remind you that Christmas is approaching and many of us, we are thinking what kind of gift, gift we should buy for our children and relatives. I can tell a tip for you. The best gift, gift ever you can buy for your children, for yourself, for your teachers, it's good education. If you got the proper education, you, you are well prepared for the great moment when your opportunity arrives.
Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kumpulainen, for this in-depth look into leadership. Uh, now it is time to move on to our panel discussion with the Finnish universities, moderated by Ms. Nurihan Azizan. Uh, at this point, I'd also like to note uh, that we're already quite a bit late from our schedule. So uh, I think that uh, it, it would be a good idea to give ourselves a little bit more time and aim to end the panel discussion around 4.30 instead of 4.20, uh, as mentioned in the program. And I very much hope that all of you participating in the audience will be able to remain online for a few extra extra minutes. But uh, like I said, now it's time to move on to the panel. Uh, and in the panel, uh, our moderator will be Ms. Azizan, who is a senior lecturer in Institute Aminuddin Bagi, the main education leadership and management institute in Malaysia, uh, with a goal to develop professionalism in the educational leadership at all levels of the Ministry of Education in Malaysia. Ms. Azizan herself is a highly esteemed and awarded lecturer with a total of 34 years of work experience with the Ministry of Education. Her field of expertise is in instructional leadership, school project management, and coaching and mentoring. And our esteemed panelists from Finland represent uh, the University of Helsinki, University of Jyväskylä, University of Lapland, and University of Oulu. And they will have an opportunity to, to introduce themselves very shortly. But for now, uh, please, Ms. Azizan, the floor is yours. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Iro, for the introduction. And it is a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, it is a good opportunity to be with all the distinguished uh, speakers, keynote speakers, and also the panelists for today's forum. Yeah? Um, good afternoon, yeah? or good morning in Finland. And assalamu alaikum uh, to His Excellency, uh, Mr. Sami Leno. Uh, the ambassador of uh, Finland to Malaysia, Ms. Nina Adlan Disney, the executive uh, director, Lipet uh, Services, Dr. Kari Kumpulat, director of University of Oulu, and our four forum panelists for today. So I would like uh, to take this opportunity uh, to let our four panelists introduce our, uh, themselves uh, before we start our discussion. So to start with the discussion, uh, the introduction, I would like to call upon Mr. Panu Postman to start with the introduction. Mr. Panu, okay. can you introduce? Yes. Thank you. I'll quickly start with a uh, few slides from my part. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for inviting. It's an honor. And thank you for everybody being present here today. Uh, my name is Panu Forsman. I work as a university teacher at the University of Jyväskylä and there in the Institute of Educational Leadership. And um, is it intended that I, I introduce here also our institute? I assume so. So Institute of Educa Education Leadership, uh, a quite a unique place in, in University of Yvaskula uh, with strong local global networks, uh, long tradition already. You can see from the slide list uh, started in the mid nineties with principal, principal preparation programs. And they were expanded quite a lot uh, from that offering nowadays basic studies, intermediate studies, advanced studies in educational leadership. We have had doctoral students from 2004 uh, to uh, international master degree program focusing on, on educational leadership since 2007, nowadays part of our general education science program, EDUMA. There is a advanced studies offered there and, and professorship in educational leadership in uh, 2014. And uh, well, in our university, uh, we 
we are located in the Faculty of Education Psychology and there are uh, three different departments. While we are structurally under Department of Education, we work closely with the teacher education and Department of Psychology, of course, also. And, and just briefly trying to show the, the extent of, of the research and, and training done here. For example, if, if we think that that principal training focuses largely on, on teachers, preparing teachers, we have uh, degree students also participating the principal um, basically basic studies in education leadership, giving the principal qualifications in Finland as a part of the degree, uh, seeing that important nowadays. And then, for example, in adult education, close collaboration with people doing research on a contemporary work environment where actually um, education leadership connects nowadays with uh, different sort of human development, learning possibilities in, in contemporary work. So quite a broad range there. Uh, that, that's in really brief. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Panu. Uh, next, we would like to invite Dr. Laurie Hekonen from University of Helsinki. Uh, Dr. Laurie, please uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Laurie Hekonen and uh, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the, at the University of Helsinki. Here I work in the Center for Educational uh, Assessment and uh, also work in the, the research group called uh, Leadership in Educational Contexts. And uh, in my research, I'm interested in how teachers develop their work, how, how teachers uh, develop their schools together uh, and how leadership can, can uh, facilitate and support such, such uh, school development. And here in, uh, in our university, we, we, we also provide professional development for, for uh, leaders in, in different, working in different uh, educational institutions. And, and uh, we, we provide these so-called basic level studies that also include the, the, the official qualification to, to act as a principal. And more recently, we have also developed these uh, so-called intermediate level studies, so a larger curriculum uh, with, with novel contexts uh, developed in line with, with uh, recent research literature. So that's, I'll keep it short. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Dr. Lori. Uh, next, our third panelist is Ms. Sana Korva from University of Lapland. So please introduce yourself, Ms. Sana. Thank you. Uh, greetings from Windery Lapland from the Arctic Circle. Um, my name is Sana Korva and I work as a project manager in University of Lapland, Faculty of Education. Uh, I have been developing and coordinating educational leadership and management study model at University of Lapland, which we currently offer to master students in education and social sciences. Uh, after completing their study model, students can obtain the principal's official qualification. Um, uh, study model include uh, studies in educational leadership and management, uh, as well as legislation. And um, we are also preparing in-service teachers and principals uh, already in the field with, with the same content. And we offer some shorter term in service management and leadership training as well. Uh, at the University of Lapland, we research, develop and uh, teach educational leadership in multidisciplinary collaboration between faculties of education and social sciences. So including experts in teacher education, media education, administrative sciences, uh, management and law. It's, it's really nice to be in here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Anna. Okay, our fourth uh, panelist, uh, last but not least, is Dr. Raimo Salo from uh, University of Oulu. So uh, please introduce yourself. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Dr. Raimo Salo, and I come from the Oulu University Teacher Training School. A very big thank you for all organizers for being part of the panel. It's a true pleasure. Um, 
So um, Oulu University is located in the northern part of Finland. The <clears throat> university is the second biggest and consists of uh, several faculties of which uh, we belong to the faculty of, of education. Our uh, old university teacher training school um, includes um, about 130 staff members, more than 1000 students. We are more than 400 years old. And what we do is we also provide uh, it, not only education for children, but um, to about 600 student teachers every year by giving them practical teaching experiences in our school. Our staffs are mentoring the student teachers. In addition, we provide uh, in-service training courses, for example, in the area of leadership and management. In addition, I would like to say a warm welcome to you all to visit the Finnish Pavilion in Dubai Expo 2020, which has started about a month ago. Our school will be present there if you'd like to meet us, for example, in December. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think uh, that is, uh, that's the introduction from all the four uh, panelists for today. So to cut things short, we'll start uh, with our first part uh, for this forum, which is uh, discussing on educational leadership and its governance in Finland. So I would like to call upon uh, Mr. Panu Fosman from University of Jivasulkila uh, to give his presentation. Uh, and we will be followed by Mr. Sana, uh, Ms. Sana Korva from University of Lapland. Uh, Mr. Panu. Please do your presentation. Thank you. And well, we already heard a lot of uh, Mr. Pano, we cannot hear you. Mr. Pano? I wonder if Mr. Pano Hi. Forsman can hear us, but his microphone seems to be uh, yes. not working correctly. Uh, Ms. Sana Korva, are you on online there, ready to is, double yes, up? Yes, uh, yes I'm here. Um, Maybe Ms. Ms. Sarna can start first. Uh, okay, uh, I didn't prepare any uh, slide, slides here, but um, I think that uh, when we are talk about um, uh, educational leadership in Finland, uh, we need to know the, what is the education system as a whole and how it works. So, um, Finnish uh, education system uh, consists of early childhood education, uh, pre-primary school education, basic education, up and secondary education, higher education, and, and adult education and training. Uh, that's the, uh, the, the whole, whole system. Um, and um, um, uh, the administration of uh, general education uh, is divided into two levels, the state administration uh, representing the national uh, general perspective and, and the municipal administration representing the local perspective. Um, so um, the long term principles of education are made in state administration uh, and but the municipalities are important social actors and they have a role to play in promoting local in interests. Um, in, in a municipal level, um, the administration of teaching is often centralized uh, an agency to support schools and, and to uh, ensure that national and local policies are implemented in schools uh, practices. 
the head of local education department uh, basically leads this agency and is responsible for organizing education in her or his uh, area. Um, at the unit level, principals and heads of early childhood education units of um, um, a great importance in organization and management of uh, practical activities. Um, so, so this is basically the, the, the system. Uh, now I see that Pano is there. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, maybe we can continue uh, with Mr. Pano. Are you with yes. us? Yes. All right. Yes. Sorry <laughs> for too crashing <laughs> happens really rarely but i don't know what happened yeah. so sorry for that and and it was great to hear sana's ideas on, on this uh let's see what happens now if i'll try to resume the presentation so uh i tried to not to overlap but i didn't hear everything everything sana said so sorry for for if saying saying something twice uh, I already heard a description of the of the Finnish system to some extent so maybe I'll say something about educational leadership and mm -hmm. and how we see the governance and, and look and educate for the people to work work within the system so to speak of course the important thing from the keynotes could be said to be together and as you can see we have actually crafted a visual, uh, logo type of, of, of thing emphasizing together yhdessä in, in, in Finnish that we are emphasizing in all, all the trainings we are having. Uh, we see educational leadership uh, to some extent a new, uh, new discipline and, and, and a lot of connections with leadership studies in, in general. But education as a, as a field is, is a bit different to most of them, at least in, in Finland. Um, so the important question, of course, is, is how we are seeing education and how we are seeing um, leadership. So uh, what is the function of, of education, with whom and by whom it is done? And, and in there, of course, different policy system and governance level things are important, but uh, it might be also um, Good to look look from theoretical perspectives like educational social logic perspectives for for the meanings and, and reasons of, of education, and of course already on chat there has been division between leadership and management and 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 that sort of important questions there, but also looking into organizations and how they are working. So it's not not uh, something on the top level of organization as a as a position, but it's actually something everybody in organization should have uh, to, uh, to so, so uh, creating distinction between leadership position and leadership so just quickly uh, showing the scope of, of different inspections we are having in different trainings depending on the uh, target group so educational leadership phenomena can be looked from individual level to international levels and, and everything between and for example, in our, our example, we might be going this sort of a systemic picture of governance in, 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 in Finland to try to elaborate that with our students. Also example of, of uh, city of Jyväskylä having different, different fields, but I, I believe that Sana already mentioned most of this, so thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pano and uh, Ms. Sana, for giving us the overview of the education system in Finland. At least uh, our audience will be able to understand uh, how the system works and maybe can compare with what is happening in Malaysia. Yeah? Um, next, we'll move to the second part of the forum, which will discuss on education for educational leadership in Finland. This is a very much awaited topic. And I would like to call upon Dr. Laurie Hikonen from University of Helsinki first to do the presentation. Thank you. Uh, I don't have any slides, but uh, here uh, at the University of Helsinki, we, we address, uh, address uh, 
educational leadership studies with a, with a strong uh, developmental approach that builds on, on research evidence. So, so by this, I mean that we not only construct uh, the curriculums based on, on recent international and, and, and Finnish research literature, but we also here uh, aim to act as, as, as active researchers in the field, as teachers and, and developers. Uh, so this, we, th we think that this sort of brings the topics closer to the students, supports their learning through, through uh, inquiry and, and, and sort, of, sort of provides the continuity and basis for, for, for uh, our work. So, uh, so, and also with this developmental approach, I, I mean that we continuously evaluate everything we do. So we, we, uh, we sort of, um, this sort of provides us ways to, to, to continuously adjust the, the courses we provide, but simultaneously it, uh, it allows us to collect research data on, on the perceptions of the leaders who participate. Uh, so it provides us as an opportunity to learn as, as, as teachers at the university, but also as, as researchers. Um, we also uh, educate doctors. Uh, so we have a seminar in our research group where research plans and results are presented and discussed. We supervise work of several doctoral candidates uh, working on, on uh, topics related to educational leadership. Mm -hmm. And we consider that the doctoral education is, is required to, to provide the continuity for, for this uh, sort of uh, research-based development of of uh, educational leadership studies. Okay. I'll keep it starting. And thank you. All right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Raimo Salo. Could you just uh, give your ideas on this topic? Yes. Um, so when we talk about uh, education for educational leadership um, in Finland, it's possible to study the. Uh, principles um, <clears throat> qualification either uh, during your master's degree studies when you are becoming as a teacher or after you have already graduated as a teacher because um, most if not even all principles in Finland have actually uh, worked as a teacher themselves uh, before entering the position. However, uh, at the old university teacher training school we do not provide any any formal qualifications uh, for this kind of a, a position, uh, because we what we do is we we produce in-service training courses for professional educators. Uh, one of them being the diploma program in education leadership and management, because we believe that these uh, formal uh, training courses provided at the university, they don't really uh, give all the necessary information, data, knowledge, and so forth for the principals to take care of the very demanding work. In other words, our message is very clear. In-service training needs to be added on top of the formal qualification to act as a principal. Um, hopefully also, um, <clears throat> Uh, in addition to the in-service training courses, the principals are able to join mentoring programs together with more experienced, more experienced principals who will then help them to cope with their everyday work. Um, our in-service training program includes uh, six different online courses. The topics can be seen here. Um, each of them lasts for approximately uh, 40 study hours and two months, and participants can join the very international group of, of, of students. They are also not only for the current principals and managers, but also for teachers who would like to work as a school director in the future. We provide the real-time tutoring with the experts from Finland, and also the courses are related with uh, work-based assignments 
to go hand in hand with the theory that is expressed in the literature and in the uh, uh, videos. Not, uh, not to forget the certificate that is provided for the course participants by the University of Oulu. Finally, I would like to say that um, from the point of view of an educator, we see the continuum of the education to become a principal, a school leader, uh, begins, as said, from the degree studies provided by the universities of Finland, because all teachers must acquire the master's degree uh, to become a quali qualified teacher. Um, as you enter the working life, everybody faces the induction phase, which, which lasts one to however many years it takes for individuals to cope with the new challenges in the working life. But we support this induction phase by providing also training for the mentors who are guiding the newcomers in the, in the working life. And as, you, as people will start to work, they need, as said, the in-service training courses to cope with the more and more challenging work. And for these purposes, there are also a number of training opportunities. Um, as said, hopefully the principles, all principles, can get access to uh, a mentor and mentorship programs because um, this is a very valuable addition to their formal qualification. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, what Dr. Raimo has touched just now is actually very uh, much in line with, with what uh, Institute Amin Rudin Baki in uh, Ministry of Education is doing right now. So maybe we can collaborate in the future. Yeah, for joint venture and so on. Okay, uh, maybe Mr. Pano, do you have any more uh, something to add to the topics or any ideas on that? I could just briefly, briefly add that uh, that basically in line with the previous ones, we do pretty much the same same kind of things. Seeing educational leadership as a broader. Uh, than just the position of, of principal, vice principal, or, or other these sort of formal leadership positions. We emphasize in nowadays that all education professionals are experts and they need leadership skills. And this partly comes from the change of the contemporary work environment. So we have these team training, professional training programs and, and support for support leaders and, 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 and support providers and different sort of uh, middle uh, level leadership trainings that could be seen as an entry level for those who have just done the, let's say, a master's in education, becoming a class, class teachers and then wanting to progress on their career. So largely in this sort of a lifelong learning, continuous learning uh, idea. So nothing really to add, but I just wanted to say that. <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. I think the educational leadership is a very, uh, uh, the most focused uh, topic that we have today. And uh, for our third uh, part uh, for today's forum, we will move on to creating future through educational leadership. So uh, we would like to talk about uh, this more uh, in the Malaysian context. Uh, maybe we, we should start with uh, the first question uh, for our panelists. Uh, what is the new narrative of educational leadership post COVID-19 pandemic for Malaysian leaders? Uh, maybe uh, any one of you panelists could start with this first. Yeah, Dr. Laurie. I can start, yeah. Uh... Of course, the Malaysian context is not that familiar to me, but, but uh, maybe what I want to say is in line with, with the key panelists, uh, their interesting uh, presentations. Um, if we consider the, the times of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, I would say that they have, have emphasized, that time has emphasized the need for, for, for uh, schools uh, to construct sort of cultures of, of collaboration. 
so so uh, so from the leadership perspective perspective i would say that leaders need to to facilitate practices and structures for collaboration and 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 this way support sort of the development of of of, of collective efficacy beliefs in the in the professional community um, for example there uh, there are some evidence that that schools that that uh, had had these uh, collaborative practices and structures already before the pandemic uh, have have shown to to been able to to adapt and meet the the the, the difficult time more more flexibly than than schools that don't have such and also our study here uh, has shown that that uh, the teachers collective efficacy so in schools where uh, there is a, are there is a strong collective efficacy beliefs among teachers uh, the teachers also feel felt less stress and 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 uh, uh, recovered better from the workload and also consider their schools to be better prepared for future challenges future school closures so 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 this kind of uh, viewpoint i would emphasize yeah, thank you dr lori uh, i think what we have mentioned just now is what uh, we are facing through the uh, pandemic uh, since last year. So uh, by uh, focusing on the culture and collaboration, I think it will help the teachers to more uh, do collaborative work and you know, to perform and help the students to learn. Thank you. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Raimo, if you have some other uh, ideas on this topic. Yes, thank you. Um, to me, what I how I have seen the, a pandemic, it's like a, we are entering the time of low tide. In other words, uh, we don't actually haven't, we haven't seen during the pandemic time what has been uh, covered by the, by the ocean water. So to compare it with the low tide. And now as we are approaching the time post COVID-19, we are uh, beginning to see what is revealing as the, as the ocean water is, is going towards the horizon. And, and a lot of things can be seen, which have been hiding and, and which have been hidden uh, during a long, long period of time, more than uh, half, one and a half years time. And none of us actually know the consequences that has, be, has, uh, has uh, occurred and what we are facing today. But one thing I would like to highlight uh, that has been a lot of uh, in media in Finland is the fact that, that uh, <clears throat> students' welfare, special education and, and counseling should be uh, well prepared and in place as we will, most likely we will face another uh, similar kind of uh, era in the, in the future. So hopefully, this sort of um, preparation, we have learned our lesson from this pandemic and we will get ready for the next one. Thank Good. you. Thank you, Dr. Rano. Uh, I think uh, most of all, uh, what we have learned uh, through uh, this pandemic uh, time will give uh, some ideas of what you and also Dr. Laurie has been uh, talking about so that uh, the, the leaders will be able to prepare themselves uh, for future and uh, for their um, performing schools uh, in the area of uh, leadership. And uh, by doing that, what we would like to see is uh, the students get the benefit of it. Yeah. So we will go to the next question. The second question, uh, what are the characteristics of new school leaders for the future? Maybe uh, Ms. Sana, you want to start this one first? Thank you. Um, I was thinking that um, in addition to pedagogical leadership skills, which is which is very important, uh, also more generic leadership skills are needed. Um, and we are needed education for that. Um, 
it, it's because that uh, that leaders could concentrate on pedagogical leadership, we could uh, strengthen the the generic uh, leadership skills, and and how is um, the whole education system uh, managed and lead, and how to how to um, how to lead uh, changes in a unit level, in a school level, you have to know the system and how to, how to um, work with it. So that's, that's one idea. Um, what ideas <laughs> you others have? Okay, uh, maybe uh, Mr. Panu? To, uh, what are the characteristics that you can think for the school, school uh, leaders uh, for the future? Yeah, we can of course talk about these things in, with many different concepts and, and, and through different theories. I would maybe emphasize the approach that we are having with professional identity and professional agency, because we see that in most cases, teachers in, in now and in future are highly trained, higher educated experts already. So the leadership skills are somewhat similar that we are needing in, in these sort of expert work environments. And, and this needs to be probably more softer than the traditional leadership approaches that, that, that we are still seeing from, from time to time. And this would need also for the for the leaders to develop their own uh, what could be seen included in in, in identity and, and agency from the self efficacy beliefs con, uh, confidence on, on own skills and own expertise and and when we are looking this all in a highly complex nowadays even volatile work environment after experiences of COVID uh, we need a uh, these sort of a people who are able to bravely react, transform and, and, and support people transforming the work. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hanna and Mr. Panu. But uh, what we can see from here, uh, the first part when Ms. Sana mentioned about the pedagogical leadership, uh, we in Malaysia, we focus on instructional leadership. It is uh, more or less towards that pedagogical leadership. And we hope that the school leaders will be able to uh, plan uh, the activities well in their school yeah, with the middle leaders. And the second part, when we say that uh, the leaders have to develop themselves and uh, to be highly trained as what uh, Mr. Panu said, that is what uh, Institute Amir Dembaki uh, is trying to do. Yeah? We develop school leaders so that they will be able to uh, develop uh, the school uh, leadership team and also the middle leader team for them to work together and to help the, the teachers and also the students in school. Um, what we can see in the Finland uh, education system is that teachers uh, in Finland has been selected through rigorous and selective professional schools, meaning now, uh, you have uh, teachers who are committed and has a high accountability in schools that could help you in doing this. So we do have, have this uh, institute uh, in, um, in Malaysia who select uh, students uh, to be uh, the uh, novice teachers. And also we hope that they will be good and uh, trained teachers in future. So I think with that, we have come to uh, the end of the third uh, part, the third session. So I think uh, uh, I would like to say thanks to all the panelists uh, for our discussion today. And I hope our audience will be able to get uh, something out of our discussion, learn, and maybe we, they can turn something into action in their own school or in their own um, you know, uh, job as uh, maybe trainers and so on. Um, so with that, uh, I hand it over to Iro. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Azizan, and to all of our uh, panelists for the extremely 
uh, interesting discussion so far. Uh, I think we have already come to the end of end of the program time-wise, but uh, there w- I, I believe that we could still take one or two questions from the from the audience, uh, assuming that all of our good speakers and panelists will be able to stay stay online for a couple of a couple of extra minutes. Uh, in the in the chat, there was at least a question relating to uh, the role of retired school leaders uh, and how do they contribute uh, to the in-service courses. And maybe to expand a little bit uh, on that, how do you see the role of mentoring uh, more generally uh, in the uh, educational leadership training and who are, uh, in your opinion, good educational leadership trainers. So I'm not going to direct this to uh, anyone specifically uh, of you uh, panelists. So if any one of you feels like he would want to take this up, please just either raise your hand virtually or just open your mic. Thank you. Mr. Panu Forsman, please go ahead. Yeah, I could just quickly say that that according to our experiences, these mentoring and training programs where we have invited people from our networks, people working as a principals and people working in different leadership positions, and even outside educational leadership, they have been seen highly valuable by the participants. So enabling the discussion between different participants and, and uh, tapping from the experiences of, of people working in the field, they have, they have been highly valued and seen important along the uh, theoretical and, and, and practical uh, information given, given in different trainings, whatever the uh, main topic of the, of the training has been. So I would emphasize that, that this has been experienced as a, as a really uh, valuable tool. Thank you for those remarks. Do uh, any anyone else of you good panelists have anything on this? If not, I, I just like uh, to say briefly that um, yes, I I also agree totally with the um, power of mentoring and and how do we see it at the old university teacher training school is the fact that this kind of uh, uh, mentoring opportunities offer the participants time and space to uh, reveal their unconscious thoughts and ideas in, in dialogue, di- dialogue with the mentoring mentor. Uh, since usually, as we uh, know, the, the working life in a school environment is very hectic and busy. So the mentoring sessions offer the rare opportunities for the mentees to sit down and really think through uh, their way of uh, leadership and management, what are the principles, values, and so forth. I wonder how we lost Eero there from the connection. I can jump in in in, in turn of Eero. Hopefully he will be back soon. Uh, maybe just one more question to your uh, the panelist or also Dr. Karyano has been very. My name is Anna Korpi, by the way. I'm the uh, I'm Eero's and the ambassador's colleague from the Embassy of Finland in Singapore, and. Um, now Eero is back, but I can go ahead and ask this question <laughs> till the end, so that uh, I know that many Sorry of you have a lo- uh, many of you have a lot of international cooperation. How do you see that? How well? How how does the sort of Finnish style of educational leadership training um, fit in other contexts? As we see, like principals in other countries work in very different contexts uh, in terms of the education systems, in terms of their accountability pressures, and all of this. So. How, from your experience in the different uh, different projects, what what have been possible challenges or or things to kind of be mindful and and to overcome? Uh, 
Well, if I may quickly share our experiences, we've had several international uh, participant groups in our online training programs for the uh, school leaders. And <clears throat> what, what we have found out that especially the um, uh, small group assignments where, where people are able to either uh, discuss in real time together or um, through the assignments uh, in, in online uh, asynchronous assignments, they truly find these situations uh, fascinating. They learn from one another and what comes to the uh, topic, uh, topics that are related to the, to the training sessions uh, is quite natural, as we have heard already in the beginning of this this um, event, that every every um, training must be more or less contextualized. That's a that's a fact. But um, we have we have tried our very best to take care of this as we have planned and and formulated our course uh, content so that they are general enough to be uh, applied to any, any uh, cultural or, or country context. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Salo, and thank you, Anna, for bringing this uh, uh, important topic up while I was experiencing some technical uh, difficulties. I don't know if uh, any of you other panelists have something to add to what uh, Dr. Salo shared with us just now. If not, we could perhaps, or do I see someone? No, uh, but in case not, perhaps we could take one, one last quick question from the, uh, from the chat before we conclude. Uh, I think that in the beginning, there was all, also one question directed to uh, one of our keynote speakers, uh, Miss Nina, considering the uh, role of educational leadership in nation building. So perhaps, uh, Miss Nina, if you're still still with us, uh, would you be so kind to briefly say if you have any any thoughts of the role of educational leadership in nation building, especially in uh, here in Malaysia? Yes, Thank absolutely. You. Thank you. And I just want to, you know, commend the panelists. There's been so many amazing uh, thoughts and insights that have been shared today. Um, I think it's very clear that educational leaders do shape the culture of a school. Uh, and in shaping the culture of a school, <laughs> they shape the culture and the ideas and thoughts and attitudes of the students in that school. So. There is no doubt in my mind that leaders, educational leaders, set the tone for student outcomes. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and in shaping student outcomes, we are shaping the future. <laughs> so there is no doubt in my mind that nation building and educational leaders are inextricably connected. And we have to keep improving. And it is a continuous developmental journey. I think if there was one thing I would like to say about leadership is that leadership has to provide that safe space, that developmental uh, approach to improving teacher practice, right? Because it's only with that safe space, that focus on development, when we are able to truly accept um, which are the areas that we need to improve on, that's where the improvement comes. And it has to be collaborative. You know, the day of a, the days of a teacher just standing in a classroom and being the master or the mistress of his or her domain no longer exists. Uh, it has to be a collaborative effort and leaders have to, you know, set the tone for that uh, collaboration. Thanks. Well said, and if I may continue, you, you mentioned and highlighted the importance of future. Uh, we also believe that this sort of future leadership academy could be established uh, in, in country contexts where we give opportunities for the current teacher leaders, middle management, uh, to participate in management courses already at this point, because 
they will be the future leaders. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think future leaders have to be comfortable with the uncertainty of the future, embrace it. You know, the volatility, the uncertainty, that is our new normal. Um, and, you know, you can't just retreat into this kind of, you know, set piece that you've been comfortable with. It is about coming out of your comfort zone and being prepared for whatever we have uh, that's going to hit us next. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I think that with these words and excellent answers to, uh, to our questions, it is time to conclude uh, this Finland Malaysia Education Leadership Forum. Uh, before we end, uh, I would uh, like to remind you or tell you uh, all of our uh, esteemed participants and members of the audience uh, that in case you had any further questions for the uh, for the four panelists or the keynote speakers or especially if you have interest in contacting uh, one or all of the four participating Finnish universities in order to learn more from their educational leadership uh, training offer uh, we will be providing uh, all registered participants uh, more information alongside with the contact info of the of the four universe of the four universities and the panelists present so apologies for running a little bit uh, over time uh, but i hope that you have enjoyed uh, the discussion and uh, learned from the experiences and solutions of our speakers today uh, and inspired or uh, got new ideas for your own own work from the from the exchange today. So finally, I would just like to thank our keynote speakers once, once more alongside with our four excellent panelists and our excellent panel moderator for, uh, for this afternoon uh, in, with the topic of educational leadership. Thank you so much for, for participating, everyone, uh, and good afternoon and goodbye. Thank you.